Welcome. This is presentation number 19 in our series, Rereading the Fourth Gospel, the story of Jesus the Revealer. And <clears throat> our topic today is the community and the world. And I need to do a little bit of background here because we will <coughs> get into material that will not be uniform uniformly familiar to uh, readers, the kind of readers we are and virgin readers. So <coughs> here is an illustration I have used earlier about a timeline for what we uh, have ostensibly in, in the fourth gospel. So, and my question is, which is the story told here? Because <coughs> the life of Jesus the story of Jesus, the revealer, is a story that in the gospel unfolds in this territory here, uh, in AD 30 to 33 in the gospel. And then we have said that this story is remembered and written much later. So it takes a while before its writing, and there is good agreement about uh, uh, sort of approximately when the story may have been written. But then there is this other uh, idea that in this time here, in this period of time here, we have another story emerging. And that is the story of the so-called Johannine community. And it's called the Johannine community, but it will also be the community of the beloved disciple who the gospel presents as the, as the source. So we have two, you might say, complementary, and I will say competing foci. The one focus is the story of Jesus, and most readers who are not <coughs> attuned to anything will think that is the story we are reading. But then scholars come along and they say, well, that's not exactly the story we're reading. Im embedded in the gospel, in the fourth gospel, we also have the story of the Johannine community. And this is a big, big item in uh, scholarship. So <coughs> we can begin with Bultmann, who is <coughs> the most influential uh, Johannine scholar in the 20th century. He taught for many years in the university or in a university in Marburg in Germany, and he wrote a commentary on the Gospel of John that is regarded as the most influential book written on John in the 20th century. <coughs> so what does he say? We must recognize that a literary work or a fragment of tradition is a primary source for the historical situation out of which it arose and is only a secondary source for the historical details concerning which it gives information. So what is it? It's the teller of the story that becomes sort of primary, the primary topic. And the story, the sort of in the background, is a second, it, the, that is not the primary errand of the, or, or we don't have a, we don't have a first hand access to the Jesus story. We have first hand access to the story of, let's say, the community. And I have taken an interest in Bultmann for many reasons. And here, let's see if I can st st stand aside here. This is the Phillips University in Marburg. This is where Bultmann taught for 30 years. And it is the oldest Protestant university in the world, a very prestigious institution. I went there in April of 2019 because I was on a Holocaust trip and I was interested in uh, Bultmann's role and what happened and didn't happen in relation to the Jews in Marburg. It's another topic for another time, but I did go inside the building <coughs> and I did find this plaque of Wolfmann 
his footprint in the institution and his uh, the time, the 30 years that he taught there. I did go to a bookstore nearby too and asked them how many titles they had of Bultmann and they didn't have many. Actually, they didn't have any because Bultmann's influence is waning and is waning even at his institution where he, where he taught. So that was quite intriguing. But this view, this view of a Johannine community has kept on and has been dominant, dominant in studies. And here is another one who is also concerned about constructing the situation in which this gospel arose. This is J. Lewis Martin, who also had been influential and scholars say that his book on the Gospel of John is the second most influential book written on the topic in the 20th century. So we can't really ignore, ignore these uh, things and you will also, I hope, to show a major reason why we shouldn't ignore it. <clears throat> so he says that our first task, however, is to say something as specific as possible about the actual circumstances in which John wrote his gospel. How are we to picture daily life in John's church? Have elements of its peculiar daily experiences left their stamp on the gospel penned by one of its members? So the question here, John's church, do we see anything of that, the believing community? have their daily experiences, can we sort of spot them in the text of the, of the gospel? May one sense, even in its exalted cadences, the voice of a Christian theologian who writes in response to contemporary events and issues which concern or should concern all members of the Christian community in which he lives. So, he opens the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, and reads and looks for clues to the community within which this story is told or uh, originated. And here is <coughs> one more, and he could well be the third most influential person. This is Raymond Bra Brown, writing from a Roman Catholic perspective. Although, when it comes to scholarship on John, you can just forget about Catholic versus Protestant. There isn't much of that. This is a very ecumenical approach, and Raymond Brown wrote the two-volume commentary in the Anchor Bible series early at the time that made this a commentary that was the main one. So what does he say about the community? Well, he goes to it with gusto and very detailed. So he says there are four faces you can trace in the Gospel of John and in the epistles of John. One, two, or three, those uh, letters of John. You can spot a phase one that lasted from about 50 to the 80s. And there is an originating group in Palestine they include followers of John the Baptist, and they developed around the beloved disciple who had been a follower of Jesus, although necessarily a member of the Twelve. That's phase one. And then phase two takes you to about 90 in the first century. The gospel was written. So now we have the fourth gospel. And he's, he claims that it addresses six groups within the Johannine community. And the Johannine community has likely moved uh, by this time to a diaspora setting wherein the gospel was extended to the Greeks as well as the Jews. So we're in Palestine here, now we're not in Palestine anymore, and it's a complex situation that can be traced if we pay attention to certain clues in the text. <clears throat> then there is a phase Three, now the epistles are written and the Johannine community's internal tensions are unfolded more clearly in the light of the epistles. 
And then there is a phase four. Of course, now we are outside the Bible, after Bible times. After the epistles, following their departure, the Johannine successionists moved from Docetism, where you think that Jesus didn't really become human. It was a kind of appearances of that. Uh, they moved from Docetism into Christian Gnosticism of the mid-second century. And these are important terms. We could explain them. We don't need to. We can just look at the su uh, subtitle of Raymond Brown's book, The Community of the Beloved Disciple. The life loves and hates of an individual church in New Testament times composed and made available to us on the basis of the fourth gospel and the three epistles attributed to John. <coughs> We're not done. We're not done. There is more. <coughs> so this is Wayne Meeks. Wayne Meeks taught at Yale University, one of the most prestigious universities in the U.S. for many years. And now <coughs> my oldest daughter teaches and is a professor at Yale. <coughs> so I have very unexpectedly in life gotten a sort of seat to at the table indirectly to this uh, <coughs> auspicious institution. <coughs> Wayne Meeks, as a New Testament scholar, he wrote in 1972 an article called The Man from Heaven in Johannine Sectarianism. So <clears throat> this is what he says. Nevertheless, it has become abundantly clear that the Johannine literature is the product not of a lone genius, but of a community or group of communities that evidently persisted with some consistent identity over a considerable span of time. So we have Bultmann, we have <coughs> Lewis Martin, number one and number two in Johannine scholarship, maybe number three, Raymond Brown, and we have Wayne Meeks. We have people at the top of the knowledge pyramid of <coughs> in the academic community seeing this matter this way. And if we go back then to our, to our uh, timeline, then what is necessary and maybe the main thing is really what happens here. And less so what happened here. I'm not crossing it out uh, in reality. I'm just sort of doing this, uh, exaggerating a it a little bit for our purposes. <coughs> so why bring this up? Why bring this up? Well, let's listen a little more to what Wayne Meeks will be saying. <coughs> One of the primary functions of the book, the fourth gospel, therefore, must have been to provide a reinforcement for the community's social identity, which appears to have been largely negative. That is to say that the group sense of itself and its relation to the world is not much to boast about. It's really quite negative. It provided a symbolic universe which gave religious leg le legitimacy, a theodicy, to the group's actual s isolation from the larger society. <coughs> so what are the elements here that are coming? Well, it is a sectarian group. It is sequestered, you might say isolated, from the larger believing communities or the Christian movement. You might say it is off on its own, sort of in, without allowing outside influences on itself and without engaging with the outside. It has a tendency to do inreach. It is identitarian. It wants to preserve its own identity more than it wants to reach out to the world. And there is a kind of us versus them mentality or ambience here. And us versus them is also us versus 
the Jews, you, you might say. So these are uh, some elements, and this is a reason to bring it up and to assess it and see what we come up with. <coughs> so how does it look at the world? Uh, and again, here is Wayne Meeks. <coughs> it could hardly be regarded as a missionary tract, for we may imagine that only a very rare insider would get past the barrier of its closed metaphorical system. It is a book for insiders. For if one already belonged to the Johannine community, then we may presume that the manifold bits of tradition that have taken a distinctive form in the, in the Johannine circle would be familiar. If you're an insider, you understand it. If you're not an insider, you can't understand it because the language is so, so elusive and so strange. So here is the Johannine community walled off from the world around it and developing its own language, its own uh, terminology, uh, and, and uh, a, a work then for insiders. And I'm reading on from, from Meeks. The cross-references in the book, so frequently anachronistic, <coughs> within the fictional sequence of events, would be immediately recognizable. The double entendre, which produces mystified and stupid questions from the fictional dialogue partners and from other com modern commentators, would be acknowledged by a knowing and superior smile. If you're an insider, you understand this, that there are, there's a code in that language, and you as an insider understand it. But the outsiders uh, that are known to those on the inside, they don't understand and they are, in some ways, there is a condescending attitude on, of the insider toward the outsider. And here again, this then would be the illustration of the Johannine uh, believers as separate from others and separate from the world. <coughs> so, <coughs> very lately, uh, or just to sort of reinforcing or to sort of fighting because <coughs> there has been a pushback against this view, the, this uh, Johannine community view in more recent Johannine scholarship. There has been a pushback, but here is a recent <coughs> article from 2020 by a leading uh, Martinez de Boer in, in uh, Holland uh, defending the view <coughs> of this community reading, uh, specifically the community-centered reading of John chapter 9, the story of the man who was born blind and who was healed. <coughs> and then <coughs> the Boer will say, my primary question was, why would the Pharisees in John's setting have found the confession of Jesus as Messiah so offensive? that they felt it necessary to effect the formulation of an edict to expel those Jews espou espousing this messianic faith. The idea here is that sometime after maybe the fall of Jerusalem, around that time, those who confessed Jesus would be expelled by the synagogue. It's not what happened in the time of Jesus that matters, it's what happened later. So here is his answer. My answer has been that they found this confession offensive because of Johannine behavior on the Sabbath, which deviated from developing Pharisaic views on the matter. So there is a controversy in, of the Johannine believers in relation to the synagogue, the synagogue thinks that they are not keeping the Sabbath the right way and expels them from the synagogue. And the story of Jesus who heals the man born blind is hard to see. You don't see the primary story. That is in some ways maybe an invention in order to give sort of a, what should I say, to amplify 
the problem that the Johannine believers face in relation to the synagogue. <coughs> so I thought of this. I have a headline here. <coughs> the nail soup in Norwegian, it's called speaker soup. <coughs> But it's a story that you find, a kind of fairy tale that you find in, in Europe in many contexts. In Northern Europe, it's called nail soup. In Southern Europe, it is apparently called stone soup. <coughs> and here is an illustration of stone soup. This man has a stone. He's a, an itinerant, maybe a monk, uh, who has a stone in his hand. And here we are going to make soup. <coughs> but the person in in Northern European uh, story, he is, a, he is a vagabond, who is a poor, destitute vagabond who walks around with a nail. And anyway, they come to a person, and initially the, the person who has means and has food uh, will uh, <coughs> rebuff the, the itinerant person. But then he will say that I have... I can make soup. I, can, I have uh, resources with which to make soup. And in the Northern European version, he takes out his nail and puts it in water and starts boiling the water. And uh, a lady who is kind of taken aback and says, you cannot make soup of this. And he says, well, you just wait and see. I'm going to have the most amazing soup. And then he says, well, if I had a little salt, we could have more amazing soup. And she says, well, I think I have some salt here. We can, you know, add that. And he said, well, if you had a little flour, <coughs> it would be even better. And sure enough, you know, she comes with flour. And then he says, well, you know, it would be even better <coughs> if we had some vegetables to add to it. And so there is salt and there is flour and there is vegetables and there is wonderful soup cooked on a nail. You know, that would be very unpromising material to begin with. But in some ways the Johannine community is the nail soup of Johannine studies. That you bring to that topic something quite unpromising. The theory, the notion of a community that is the topic of our text. And you could only make that work by adding this and that and that mostly on assumptions, not by real evidence, but by assumptive evidence. So that's what we, what we have here. So what we end up with then is a community hypothesis that is not a complement to our story, but in competition. It is a competitive relationship between the story of the revealer and the ostensive story of the community. So here in the, co in the revealer uh, paradigm, Jesus reveals God and he corrects misconceptions about God. And Jesus creates a community. He does create a community. That's in the text. But that community will preserve the revelation and share it in the world. And the community tells his story not its own. In contrast, here the community, Jesus recedes into the background. The community becomes the story. And the community is in retreat in relation to the world. It is a sectarian community. And yes, the fourth gospel significantly then tells its story, the community story, and not his story. So those are the paradigms in contrast. Now, for a rebuttal, for a contrary point of view that has been voiced with some increasing vigor the last 20 years, beginning in some ways with this book that is uh, partly written by Richard Bauckham and, and partly w by other contributors in 1998. <coughs> so here is <coughs> Richard Burridge, who has written a major work on the Gospels, the genre of the Gospel, what type of literature the Gospels are. And to make a long story short, he thinks that the Gospels confirm to the, conform to the genre of ancient biography. 
They are Jesus biographies, you might say, written according to the standard of biography writing of its time. And so here is <coughs> from his chapter in this book. The crucial implication for our purpose here is that there was no author to speak of in the community idea, no individual mind behind the text. The evangelists were seen as merely stenographers at the end of the oral tunnel, stringing together the pearls of wisdom composed by various early preachers. This is authorship by committee, with notes from a secretary. Thus are three basic questions about the, go the Gospels of author, subject, and audience can be answered as by communities, now, by committees, for communities, about the faith, that is to say, the faith of the community. So, we have moved a long ways. Now, <coughs> the most vociferous uh, a critic of the community hypothesis is my own mentor, Richard Bauckham, that I have mentioned, and always positively mentioned, uh, uh, several times in, in, in uh, uh, this course. <coughs> so, this is... Uh, 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 Richard Bauckham, he is now <coughs> retired at in Cambridge. <coughs> but this is what he says. First, the attempt by the current consensus in gospel scholarship to give the so-called Matthean, Markan, Lucan, and Johannine communities a key hermeneutical role in the interpretation of the gospels is wholly mistaken. That's as no concession. Maybe he overstates it. I really don't think so. I have tried to think uh, because I was so, so uh, persuaded by his argument, but I really think <coughs> that, uh, that his uh, criticism is warranted. And this is the book that made uh, quite a big splash when it was published in 1998, the Gospel, the Gospel for All Christians, Rethinking the Gospel Audiences. Whatever the influences on an evangelist's work may have been, its implied readership is not a specific audience, like the Johannine community, large or small, but an indefinite readership, large audience. Any or every church of the late first century to which its gospel might circulate. And then <coughs> there is a third uh, thing here, one more thing from Bochum, and <coughs> just to, to drive the point home. Thus any reader who finds the argument of this chapter convincing should cease to use the term Matthean community, Markan community, Lucan community, and Johannine community. They no longer have a useful meaning. That's what he says in his chapter, For Whom Were Gospels Written? To whom it may concern, maybe even for people who are not believers, as I will show a little in our very last uh, presentation in our series. Uh, so, <coughs> the argument then, just to back off a little, he says, the argument does not represent the gospel as autonomous literary works, floating free of any historical context. It's not like, you know, this is not, there is no context. There is a context. The Gospels have a context, but that context is not the evangelist's community. Uh, so uh, let me <coughs> interject something here that I have done, that we did early on in our second presentation on memory and manuscript. Uh, this is... <coughs> the historian Otto Dov Kulko, who died this year, and who uh, wrote uh, extensively on history of the 20, 20th century in relation to Jews. And then, uh, some, maybe be, uh, when he was in his 50s or 60s, he took out a tape recorder and talked into the tape recorder some memories of his time in the family camp at Auschwitz, where he was an inmate with his family 
for some time until <coughs> he was liberated. His mother perished uh, during the Holocaust. The title is Landscapes of the Metropolis of Death. <coughs> and so he talked into the tape recorder, wasn't sure what to do about it. Then somebody uh, transcribed it. And not till 2014 was this memory from the time he was present at Auschwitz. Let's see, 1944, that's 50 years. That's as long as the time between the life of Jesus and the writing down approximately of the fourth gospel in, in our uh, sort of biblical uh, framework. So <coughs> this is what, what uh, Kolka will say, the hidden meaning of the metaphoric language, because he also has metaphoric language similar to the gospel of John in many ways. Uh, uh, the hidden meaning of the metaphoric language of the central recurrent motifs in the book reaches beyond the experience of the world of Auschwitz. They are kind of expanding to see reality, to see the world a certain way. They are metaphors for what at the time seemed to expand into a world order that would change the course of human history and remain so in my reflective memory. No one who reads Landscapes of the Metropolis of Death will doubt that you are being treated to a first-hand account of what happened at Auschwitz-Birkenau. No one. It's a very moving book. But we will also appreciate that this is a memory that has been refined through time. It's not been diluted. It has in some ways been deepened by this man's sort of working on it. And I think it works very well as an analogy of the gospel of <coughs> for the Gospel of John. There are some stories that are preservable and worth preserving. And yes, again, I'll do a, a sort of an aside to things that happened during the Holocaust. These are <coughs> stumbling stones in a pavement in Oslo, in the central part of Oslo, Norway. I have seen them. This, I took this picture myself. And here is Moses Levinson, and here is Mina Levinson. They are the grandparents of my friend. I will not name her, but she is still alive. And I came here to, to uh, be with her when she was cleaning the stumbling stones. Uh, let's see, we did that two years ago, I think, and we'll do it again this year. That's her aunt, Mina Levinson. So they were sent from Norway to Auschwitz on November 26, 1942. And they died at Auschwitz on December 1, 1942. December 1, 1942. And sure enough, she also died December 1, 1942, immediately upon arrival in Auschwitz. <laughs> Stories preservable and worth preserving. This is the granddaughter, my friend, now polishing the stones. And what we have in the Gospel of John, it's much better to see it as polished stones, polished stumbling stones that, of a story that is preservable and worth preserving. So here she is. You know, and we talked about it the other day. We were together, we spent five hours together last night because she and her husband, who is a few years her senior, they could easily also today have been stumbling stones on the streets of Oslo. <coughs> Enough of that. Let's go to the text of John and the story of, the wor of community and world in John. What do we find? So <coughs> here is in the world and here is the text. The next day he saw Jesus coming, John the Baptist, and declared, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the world. It's inclusive. It's not the, those or those or those. It's the world, the whole thing. And here, 
this most quoted statement from all of Scripture. God loved what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And here <coughs> in chapter 4 in Samaria, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world, including Samaritans. And, yes, it's the world, no less than the world. And <clears throat> here we can walk through and see that this is a theme in all of the Gospel of John. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that. This is Martha speaking after <coughs> in the raising of Lazarus. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The world is his arena. Reaching the world is his goal. <coughs> and... <coughs> Uh, uh, and the role of the community, the role of the community is the role of mediator to the world. Not withdrawing from the world, but mediating to the world the story. And not itself becoming the story. And we can see this in really, uh, at the uh, last meal. <coughs> Jesus says, this is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Well, so there is a privileging of the community. The world cannot receive the Spirit because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. And a question comes up. Judas asks it. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And the answer is not because I care more about you than I care about the world. The answer is, I will reveal myself to you, and you will mediate revelation to the world. There is a role for the community, the community as mediator. And, then, and just to uh, broaden our scope a little, so people are called in this story, and as soon as they are called, they are also sent. The notion of being sent is so uh, central in the gospel here with the man born blind go and wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent then he went and came back able to see and after that he is a witness and a very effective witness as you have sent me he says in his last prayer as you have sent me into the world so I have sent them into the world so connecting to the world is there all the way Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And this is after the resurrection. <clears throat> so let me try to show how this works out in all of the gospel. I call it healing for a broken world, revelation and healing for a broken world. We can begin with the woman in Samaria and we can read how Jesus expands the horizon, how he breaks down boundaries. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? It takes a Jesus to do that. It's not going to happen uh, as a community. Or the paralytic by the pool who says, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. A man who feels abandoned. Abandoned by humans, maybe abandoned by God, is now <coughs> the subject of attention for Jesus. And here we have the woman caught in adultery. And Jesus changes the way religious communities tend to respond to people in that situation. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. And then... We have the man born blind, and <coughs> we have an explanatory paradigm for his predicament. 
the disciples even, they say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, it wasn't him and it wasn't his parents. He has another way of looking at human plight. And then <coughs> the Greeks come to Philip and they say, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And in the course of that uh, scene or scenario, Jesus will say, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Boundaries are broken down. The world is sort of coming together and Jesus is the great gatherer and the great healer here. <coughs> and we have a community. The community will mediate healing. The foot washing is a story of friendship. And Jesus pours water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. And one can read that and one cannot fully explain it, except we have tried to say that he is creating a community of friends. We have already looked at the notion of calling and sending here. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. There's no withdrawal from the world here. And then as a big ticket item, we have the universalist imprint of Isaiah on the fourth gospel. And we have looked at that a number of times. And here is a text from Isaiah 49. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors, survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. There is a role for community, but the primary story is not the story about the community. It is uh, the story of the revealer in the world. And maybe this text, and I am using my sort of theme illustration for it, <coughs> it's a centered community that will <coughs> do ministry in the world. Jesus is praying, I ask not only on behalf of these, this core group, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The indwelling of the Son and the Father, and of the Father and the Son, the indwelling of God in humans, these are demanding terms, but they are depicting a centered community, a community centered around the revealer. And Michelangelo's illustration works very well for that community. There are eight bodies close to the revealer, and in the background he sketches a other heads. I have counted at least 14, all of them, all of them, at least 14, that are all sort of centered, and they are that community that will mediate knowledge of the revealer to the world. <coughs> okay, let's do a review. Community and the world in review. Scholars attempt to make the Johannan community a main concern in the fourth gospel, as though a gospel by the community, about the community, for the community, <coughs> I think we could call that a colossal and consequential mistake, even though it is <coughs> the sources are great, great scholars. Its main tenet to explain the opposition to Jesus by the Jews is better explained by the story of Jesus in his own time. <coughs> And this community reading eclipses the theological message of the book, what the revealer reveals about God when he meets the Samaritan woman, when he, Jesus walks by the well, uh, by, the, uh, by the pool, when he goes to the man born blind, and so on. So this reading uh, uh, obscures that and it replaces the inclusive universalist thrust 
with a narrow sectarian horizon. <clears throat> the revealer brings to view a God who loves the world and a God who is in the world as a beacon of light and healing. And there is a community, a community of friendship and oneness, but it is a community oriented toward the world. And my last point, this is a difficult one. And the community-centered reading of the fourth gospel is misguided and unwarranted. Nevertheless, unintentionally as it were, nevertheless it reflects unintentionally how a faith community is at risk to making itself the story. And I belong to a faith community that has, in some ways, exemplifies that risk that instead of telling the story about God and the Revealer, one might just revert to making ourselves an element in the story. So there is something to learn here, primarily then in the Johannine depiction of a world that is dear to God and a community called to witness for God in that world.